Hello and welcome to the Ori Spotlight Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Foster. Today we welcome Amy Kappen, the founder and executive director of the Best Day Ever Foundation. Welcome, Amy. Thanks, Jason. I appreciate being here today. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, and I'd love to uh, maybe start out by uh, learning more about uh, the Best Day Ever Foundation and about your your daughter Sophia's story. Sure. Um, it might help if I give Sophia's kind of journey background first. Please. Um, and because that really leads us eventually into the, the Best Day Ever Foundation. So um, we were just really a, a normal family. Um, my husband, Greg, and we had three kids. Um, at that time, my oldest son, Nico, was Nico was seven. The twins were five. And uh, we just were, we were kind of like the envied family in the neighborhood, just total chaos, but we had a lot of fun. And uh, I had just actually started a new job. I was really excited because I was going to have more time to be home with the family. And um, I think we had all kind of reset and it was something we were all looking forward to. And I'd only been there for about two weeks. And I remember that time Sophia had like a low grade fever. This was back in April of 2016. It was just kind of weird. Um, she had, she kept saying she had pain and we had gone to the pediatrician a couple times and they said, well, maybe she's just really in tune to um, a tooth infection or something. And we tried an antibiotic. We were giving her Tylenol. The third time, I mean, the pain was just so excruciating. I'm like, something's not right here. And we went in the next morning and we, honestly, we had demanded a blood test. I said, what's, what's going on with her? And they call us back and they're like, yeah, she has mono. Like, mono. You know, I was like, oh, that doesn't seem right. And then the pediatrician called us uh, the next day and said, you know, I'd like to retest and do a couple more blood work. And uh, I remember getting that phone call. I was in my office and I just about collapsed to my knees when the doctor called me and said, your daughter has acute lymphoblastic leukemia. You need to bring her into the hospital right away. And it was about seven o'clock at night and we drove her in. And it was just, I remember just this whirlwind of what is leukemia? We, you know, we didn't know anything about cancer. Um, and we were told uh, right away that hers was standard risk, that cure rates were greater than 90%. And they said, you know, hey, if your child's going to get cancer, this is the best one to have. But I still hate that phrase to this day. But um, we were like, okay, you know, there's all the statistics are positive. So let's, we can do this. She was following the expected protocol and uh, the treatment first couple weeks in the hospital and doing everything fine. And at the end of the, the first month when she had her uh, bone marrow aspirate, she was declared in remission. Mm -hmm. So we're like, okay, you know, but um, we're like, we can do this. And we and came. What was that first? Was it chemotherapy as the first line? I'm guessing, or yeah. So this was the, your, you know, the good tried and true forty year old chemotherapy treatment protocol of this is what's always worked. This is what we're going with. And again, as new parents to leukemia, you're you're like, okay, I, I'm gonna believe this is the best path because the cure rates are so high. It must be, must be good. Right. But about a, a month after her remission was when she had received the intrathecal uh, methotrexate mm -hmm. and she actually had a seizure that was one of the most horrific things I'd ever witnessed. And it was at that moment we realized just how archaic and how little advancement had been made in 40 years Mm -hmm. uh, the the treatment protocol because we're we're like how is this acceptable? That changed our attitudes and just even our focus from that point forward. Of I'm like okay, just because it's been around for forty years, I'm going to question it even more. Mm -hmm. And we were we were nervous at that point about just the the treatment and everything that was going on with her disease at, at that time. That was about May of 2016. And then in July, she, we thought she was having another side effect from yet another medication that escapes my mind right now because um, she had leg pain. Mm. We were in the clinic and Sophia kept saying, she's like, mom, this feels like the cancer pain is back. And the doctor's like, no, that's impossible. She's, you know, 
no child has ever relapsed at this stage of the treatment. Mm. The doctors came back a couple hours later and I mean, their heads were down and they said, we are so sorry to tell you this. She's actually relapsed. Sophia was right. Mm. She knew her body better than the doctors um, had ever anticipated. So for five years old, she was a force. And at that point, again, whirlwind of, okay, what do we do now? And they said, well, we're going to hit her with harder chemotherapy. Um, we're going to hope to get her in remission again. And then we're going straight to bone marrow transplant. Mm. And I'm like, this sounds awful. And we started having to have reproductive discussions of yes. we want to freeze her ovaries at you know, five years old. And again, a new, a new path that we were going down. Mm. But before we started the harsh chemo, so Cincinnati Children's Hospital, they were aware of the clinical trial going on at, in Philadelphia at CHOP. Mm -hmm. And they said, hey, just in case, we'd like to harvest Sophia's T cells. Kind of think of it as an emergency backup plan. And hopefully we don't even need it. You know, they had said, well, her, her cancers, for the most part, responded to things. So we just think this is a good backup plan. Mm -hmm. So we said, okay. So we delayed the chemo for a couple of days. And this was on August 1st, August 2nd of 2016, harvested her T cells. And then, honestly, put it in the back of our minds. We didn't think about it. Mm -hmm. But a month later, we learned her cancer was refractory. So at that point, it was pedal to the metal. And how do we get to Philadelphia? How do we get and use her T cells? Mm -hmm. But it wasn't until we got Sophia approved in September to be in the trial. But then we went out there. We weren't slotted until the end of October. Mm -hmm. But during that time, her... Her body started to swell. She actually, um, by October, she wasn't able to walk anymore. Five, you know, five, almost six years old at that point, her waist was double the size of mine. Mm -hmm. And I just, she was, had swollen so much. So my previously spunky, full of zest little girl was laying in a bed, not moving, miserable, and I, I just, and she was on a continuous narcotic pump by that mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. um, and when we were transferred to Philadelphia, I, I had never been so scared. And when we got to Philadelphia, they, they, uh, we actually ended up going immediately into the ICU mm. um, for respiratory because she was so swollen. So they did a full body scan. Her cancer at that point had actually mutated into lumpy tumors throughout her body. Wow. And I didn't know leukemia could do that. I just thought it stayed in the blood. And at that point, we actually went off protocol and they said, well, we're going to try. We'll try to address the lumpy tumors, get it a little bit more under control. And then we'll we'll reevaluate if she's eligible for the CAR T cell. What was supposed to be about a five to six week stay in Philadelphia turned into three and a half months. Wow. We were like, well, this is this is our biggest hope. So we saw a transformation of, again, a very swollen, very disease burdened little girl. I think the, the bone marrow aspirate right before her CAR T cells was greater than 90%. They actually don't even put a, a value if it's mm -hmm. over 90. Mm -hmm. So we knew going into it that she was going to have a very severe cytokine release or the storm. And we were prepared. But we were like, let's get these T cells again. Every hope lied within those cells. And just from a timeline perspective, I know Tom Whitehead had, had introduced us. Emily had already been treated at this point, right? So she was the first right. one in the trial. So they knew a little bit about the the drug that, that Carl had identified to help sort of mitigate cytokine release uh, a little bit. That was kind of already known at CHOP, yes. Yes, yes. and so, I'm yeah. actually glad you bring that up. So um, the trial, Sophia was patient number 120, and the, okay. they had actually modified the trial slightly um, I might mispronounce it, Tosamuzalab, Tosi is right. The, <laughs> the nickname, the abbreviation was Tosi. <laughs> yeah. um, but that was the drug because of the same exact thing with Emily Whitehead. Hmm. The storm was so severe. They they knew, um, they told us, they're like, we will probably have to use Tosi. Mm -hmm. uh, and they certainly did. Um, because much like Emily, Sophia uh, endured a very severe storm. The way I understood it was, 
when the T cells are in, injected or infused into the body, and it, it's like a war going inside of attacking all that high disease burden, your body swells again. And we were again transferred into the ICU. That was probably about 10 days in post infusion. Mm -hmm. And they were on the fence of, do we intubate her? But the, the TOSI plus steroids was actually able to get her breathing on her own. And that was the second time she actually avoided being intubated. Once all that passed, the transformation was incredible. I mean, her spunk was coming back. Her She was feisty again, firing <laughs> nurses and telling people what to do. She was trying to walk again. She was doing therapy. She was playing. And we were like, this is what's supposed to happen. Mm. And, and I mean, I remember hugging Dr. Grupp and being like, oh my gosh, this is a, this is a miracle. This is modern medicine miracle right here. Mm -hmm. And I, and I'm getting to witness it. I mean, the entire staff, the medical team on, on her case, they were just floored. I'm sure. Yeah. And we were like, we're doing this. But then there was like one little spot by her eye. So they're like, well, let's just do a biopsy because by now it should have you know, the T cells have been in her long enough. Let's, mm -hmm. you know, take a look. How so, long was that after the infusion? How many days or weeks? Close to three weeks. Okay. Three weeks after. Mm -hmm. So when they did the biopsy, it was actually pretty cool. We still have a picture of it somewhere of, it was a microscopic view of the cells and you could see the T cells surrounding the cancer cells. But so we were like, okay, T cells are still fighting. Let's keep going. Um, but then a week later, they were like, the, the swelling still hadn't, her eye still hadn't, hadn't opened. So they had to do, um, they did another biopsy. At that time, it was reversed. The cancer cells were actually outpacing the T cells. Mm -hmm. So um, it was, I mean, it was real time, you know, working together. And it was, again, pretty wild. But that was, that was actually the first time the doctors came to us and they said, we're, we're kind of out of options at this point. Um, we can give her more T cells, which we don't think will actually work, or we can try a Hail Mary. There's another drug that they said, in theory, it should work. It should kind of pump up her, her T cells that are already in her body. And uh, they just kept calling us a Hail Mary. I was like, okay. Um, Sounds like we don't have any other choice, so let's try it. So that was uh, the Pembro, or lo and behold, because um, I we had asked them, we said, has this worked with any other patient? They said, we've never tried it. Never tried it. <laughs> I said, oh, boy. <laughs> um, and that was that was December 9th. Two, two weeks later, she, her eyes were open. She was, she was incredible. She was just loving life. Uh, we had... Uh, we flew out all our entire family to Philadelphia. We stayed there for Christmas. Mm -hmm. And it, it was probably the most incredible Christmas to this day I've ever had. Mm. A couple days later, they sent us back to Cincinnati. They're like, you, you can continue her treatment back at home. And I mean, we were just hugging the doctors and we're like, this is amazing. So we came home. And then at the end of January, we had to go back for her uh, three-month bone marrow aspirate. And her clinical appearance was she was in remission. She was looking fantastic. Hmm. Uh, they, they called us the next day and they said, well, the cancer is actually coming back. She is now CD19 negative and the, the cancer was hiding from her T cells. So it, I, you know, again, I'm not a science or medical background, but just the fact that the cancer was so vicious. Mm -hmm. um, so that was the that was the second time we were told we were out of options. Mm -hmm. So we um, we planned her make a wish trip at that time because she was doing so well. The doctor said, "Go do something, take advantage of this time." Mm -hmm. So Sophia had always planned her make a wish trip was going to be to swim in mermaids. Uh, we went down to Sarasota, Florida. And they pulled together this amazing trip in under eight hours. And Sophia was there with some of her favorite people and cousins. And it was, um, 
it was a, a spectacular trip. And then um, the day we came back from our Make-A-Wish trip, we got a phone call from Philadelphia. And they said, hey, um, remember remember when we were harvesting Sophia's tea cells and we had a second batch because we had a little hiccup that they had to deal with? Well, it turned out they had kept that second batch. They said, we can put her on a CD22 trial. And I was like, woohoo, we are... <laughs> We're at it again. And mind you, this whole time, Sophia, we never once told her that she was out of options. Mm. She just did what she kept doing. Um, this was only Greg and I. And um, looking back, I I really don't know how we did it, but we we didn't cry. We didn't show any sad emotions in front of her. And mm-hmm. maybe, you know, ultimately that must have helped. But she, um, we told her, hey, you know, your, your, your cancer is being stubborn, you know, kind of like all my children. So <laughs> we are going to do another trial. And she was like, okay, you know, let's, let's go get it. Let's get these cancer cells. And uh, so we were back to children's and they said, all right, we're at it again. We have to keep her cancer at bay. Hmm. This time it was a little harder. Um, and we were giving her some pretty harsh chemo. And gosh, so this was, This was the beginning of February. We were able to stay home for a couple more weeks. And then um, she was, I mean, she was having a lot of stomach issues and she was, she started throwing up things that didn't look good. Hmm. Um, And I said, I'm like, I'm not comfortable anymore. And at that point they checked us in or admitted us into the hospital Mm -hmm. and um, it got hard. It got really, really hard. And I, I remember talking to the doctor saying, I don't think she, she can endure another storm. Mm. Like, no way. And uh, it was right around this time of year. So beginning of March, it was really hard. Mm. And she was in so much pain and again, things were coming out of her body that I just knew were not good. Mm. And then, um, then, then we got the call and they said, um, there's actually a bacteria infection in her batch of T cells. Mm. And they said the batch was destroyed. Mm. And as much as I hated hearing that, there was no other options left. There was a part of me that was relieved because I was so scared of what, I I think the storm probably would have killed her the second time. Mm. Um, So they said, you know, we're like, how long? And they said about two weeks. So um, telling, telling her that was the worst thing ever. And being the amazing kid she is, um, the doctors, they said, you guys can do whatever you want next two weeks. So we, we did choose to stay inpatient, but we had day pass. We had day passes and we'd come home and she spent as much time as possible with her brothers. We pulled them from school and her best friend. Mm-hmm. And she actually, I will never forget it. She actually told her brothers that um, her T cells were all done and that she was going to heaven. Mm. And that's just the kind of girl she was. So her brother asked her, he was their older one said, you know, what do you, well, how long do you have? And she was like, couple, couple weeks. And he's like, wow, that long. And we're we're like, Mm. Um, and she's like, right. She's like, what do you want to do? We can do whatever we want. And the kids, planned her bucket list. We went to the zoo. We did family dinners. We watched movies. We cooked things together and uh, we got a dog. We got a dog and named him best day ever. Um, (laughs) And she, she just showed us the way. What an inspirational story. She sounds like an awesome, awesome little girl. Awesome young lady. Yeah. Yeah. I I hope to be like her someday when I grow up because, um, she definitely, she knew what she was doing. So. And the, um, obviously the, 
CAR T therapy didn't have the outcome many of us would have wanted, but right. did give you sounds like some wonderful memories, certainly over the last weeks and months. It it certainly did. We many times we spoke with our oncology team, both here in Cincinnati and Philadelphia. And we said, if, if that therapy didn't exist, Sophia would have passed away in October, just a, an absolutely quick, miserable, horrific death. Mm. And CAR T cell gave us four extra months with her. And we valued and lived life to the fullest mm. that we could in that time. Yeah. And so for, you know, I mean, when you think of it in that way, it, uh, that treatment was just, it really was that modern medical miracle. It was mm. amazing. And what, I mean, I can't imagine, you know, as a parent myself, uh, going <laughs> through that, how difficult that, that must have been. And then what, what resources were available to you as a family going through leukemia treatment and what could you envision now? I mean, we've, it's now been what, five years, six years almost. Um, yeah. Well, that's what, how has the landscape changed for families and, and you know, love to segue into what you're doing with uh, the best day ever foundation as well. I, I feel like we're getting you know better about talking about what cancer really is. Um, I feel like as a society and whole, we, we just talk more about things. You think back 40 years ago, everything was taboo of, you know, don't, don't talk about the bad parts. Um, and now, um, now I, 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 you know, the, one of the resources that I wish we had had more of was more families that um, just could have shared their experiences. Um, even when, before we ended up going into the high risk bucket, mm -hmm. just being honest of what chemotherapy really does to children um, or, I mean, even adults too. I, I hear a lot of adults that, you know, don't talk about the the ugly side of cancer treatment. Mm. Um, nobody wants to get too personal. Mm -hmm. But being being candid and being available and sharing resources, because otherwise parents are going to go to Dr. Google and we all know <laughs> what kind of trouble that can cause. Um, sometimes you can find things, but other otherwise... Um, it, it can be a <laughs> dangerous tool. Right. I, I think there was at one point the oncologists were like, please don't look this up on your own. <laughs> That's right. That caused more harm than good, probably. Um, yeah. And so obviously yet during this course of this time, you met the, the Whiteheads um, mm -hmm. and we all know the wonderful work they're doing at the Emily Whitehead Foundation to, to support families and help educate them, as you're saying, and really connect families that are going through it together, you know, I think, as you said, it's sort of, you just want to know the truth, like, give me the straight, you know, the straight truth so I can prepare, deal with, you know, sort of plan for, but there aren't that many really good quality resources that really give you that level of, of information out there. At least there weren't when, when you were going through it, certainly. No, the, uh, we do have a private CAR T cell family Facebook page and the chats in that group are real and it's very supportive. Um, I mean, it's it's sad how much it's grown, but because the CAR T cell is FDA approved now, there's a lot more families and a lot more hospitals, you know, administering it. So I feel like there's a lot more talking about it, and the families are amazing as they help each other. Um, and I just I love watching the Whiteheads just continue to introduce people and connect people. They are, they're fabulous about that. And I, I don't think they sleep. I really don't. <laughs> yeah, I do get texts from Tom at odd hours of the night. So he's, you know, in a Some bucket part. somewhere fixing power lines, <laughs> texting me over coffee. But uh, right. yeah, no, I agree. They're doing fantastic work. So, I mean, what, obviously now five year, five or six years later, post FDA approval, we're in a somewhat better position and that, you know, obviously there's more options. There's six approved CAR T therapies to, ad to address a number of different types of cancer. Um, and that's a good thing, of course. Um, but we also know that access isn't great 
for patients now. It's still hard to find a, um, a center that can administer it. It's still very expensive. It can be hard. There are waiting lists. You know, what is the reality today for families out there and the families that you work with and the people that you interact with? I reflect often of how lucky we were of, we, you know, the only hurdle we had was, was time because it was the clinical, still in the clinical trial mm -hmm. stages. I don't know if it still holds true as much, but with the financial resources, um, I, I, I do know some of the families, they struggle with that. Um, different, depending on where you're from, you may not have um, all the resources readily available. One of the things that I always found was challenging too is, uh, you know, the oncologist would, they, they knew what they wanted to treat the individual patient based on whatever was going on with the symptoms, but the, the paperwork yeah. tends to slow down the process. Um, that I think families are never prepared for. And, you know, cause you're like, uh, just do it now. Why, why wouldn't you do this? Um, I, I really think that is, sounds like at least again, from who I speak with that it still uh, slows it down with it only being approved for relapse leukemias. I wish, at, or I hope at some point, I know they are fighting for it to become a frontline uh, treatment plan, mm -hmm. but to, to educate the families and to give them the options of, do you want to do the chemotherapy? Do you want to consider the CAR T cell? Or I, I forget the official, the new drug names <laughs> of them. Um, and, and having, because I, I, I think parents and patients being involved in their own cancer fight not only empowers the child, but who knows yourself and your body better. I mean, at age five slash six, Sophia was, you know, again, directing the doctors on a lot of things that they didn't, you know, <laughs> I think it's called practicing medicine for a reason. You're, you're <laughs> trying to figure it out as you go. Mm -hmm. So why not engage the parents and, and make them part of your medical team um, right away? So that way you can, everyone can make the right decisions for the kids. Right. I was speaking to, I think I might've mentioned this to you, the, to Opie Jones's family here in the UK, um, yeah. Lucy and Lewis Jones. And, um, I was completely unaware. I mean, I haven't been through it thankfully, but you know, the reproductive implications of, of chemotherapy potentially on children and young children. And, um, you know, Lucy says it very plainly and very and the best, I think, when she says, you know, it, CAR T cell therapy in her experience was just so much kinder. And why wouldn't you want people to have the kindest one first if it's equally effective or more uh, potentially? Um, but we know that that's not the case for for various reasons, for access reasons and cost reasons and other things. But um, right. obviously, you saw a lot of the challenges. Uh, of the standard of care, the 40 year old standard of care uh, that patients and families have to go through. Right. And I think, you know, you're hit, you're really hitting that point too of, of we have to change that mindset of people get, or insurance companies or who's ever ultimately approving the cost, they get caught up in, well, this one T cell infusion is going to cost X number of dollars. But now compare it holistically to, a three-year chemotherapy treatment plan. And let's add on all the other costs that ultimately come on the back end of if this child survives, they might be cancer-free, but what other issues are going on with their organs that were just beat up in the process? Mm. And there, there's a cost that no one's not necessarily always capturing in the full picture. So it's like, don't just look at this one little myopic, you know, section and focus on it, look at the holistic and to your point, the much kinder treatment to whether it's a child or young adult or adult and let's truly take care of the patient because that's ultimately what matters is the kids. And um, the, I mean, the, the success rates are pretty remarkable, mm. uh, you know, Again, we realize Sophia ended up in the, you know, the 
rare percentages twice, mm. but I think there's enough ev evidence that the the immunotherapies and the kinder treatments are, <laughs> it's just a much, much better way to go. I mean, mm. why go in with the atomic bomb when you can direct target the, the cancer cells? Mm. So it's, it's, yeah, I've heard similar similar sort of analogies. And, you know, I think the, what uh, motivated me to get involved in Ori at the beginning and is really this idea of we have cures for cancer and rare disease that patients can't get access to. And that's not okay. I no. mean, what, what's the point of having a cure for cancer if patients can't get it um, ultimately? And, and so I think your point is a great one to say, if you tally up all of those hospital visits and all the lab work and all the testing and all the administrations of chemos and all the back and forth, and how much does that actually cost? And the downstream um, of the side effects of that. Um, you know, I think if someone did the, had the big ledger and added up all the numbers, um, you know, if we're able to get potentially CAR T therapy, you know, more available and less expensive to make, it could very well be, we can make the case for first line therapy, I think quite easily, actually. Absolutely. Maybe down the road, it'll overall be a significantly lower cost therapy. So. Exactly. Exactly. Well, I'd love to hear more, obviously, in, in kind of memory of Sophia and the journey that your family's had. You've set up the Best Day Ever Foundation uh, to support other families uh, who are grieving the loss of a child. And I'd love to hear more about the foundation's work and what your goals are, why you set it up, and what kinds of great works you're doing uh, doing today. And especially, I'd love to hear about toasting to mermaids. That sounds very exciting. That <laughs> I, I, uh, I, my wife and I got married in Sarasota, so it has a special place in our oh. heart. But uh, I'd love to hear about what the mermaids are doing down there. Yeah, I do. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the, the mermaids, it, it, it just kind of evolved organically. So, you know, I, I remember actually one of the phone calls I had with one of Sophia's oncologists, maybe a, a few weeks after she had passed. And I, I, I'm, I, I just was trying to keep busy. I think I, I felt like it was probably safer for my mind. Mm -hmm. And I said, I wanna, you know, what can I do in, in honor of my daughter? I, I, I want to make sure the world doesn't forget her. And he's like, breathe first. <laughs> and um, he's like, team up with organizations. And, you know, he, he's like, lots of times it's, it's hard to, um, it, it's, it's hard to really start a whole new thing. And I said, yeah, okay. So I did for the first couple of years, I was um, working with Emily Whitehead Foundation with LLS, uh, Cancer Free Kids, Make-A-Wish. I was I think I was just fundraising for every organization that called me. I was like, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll run a campaign. Yeah. Um, again, my husband thinks I'm crazy. So, <laughs> but after a couple of years, I, I, I was like, all right, I, I don't want to just keep fundraising, um, even though I, I, you know, I can, I, I'm grateful and I still continue to do that. We started to really take a step back and, and focus and, I had done a stepped away from my career of 20 plus years of being in corporate accounting and finance. And I was became a stay at home mom. And I said, and part of this decision was because of our boys and what they needed. And we really started to self reflect and just say, there's so many great organizations doing cancer research. Mm. So I, I, I know I have no desire or to compete with them. I want to continue to support them. And then while we were in the hospital and even when we were home, there are incredible organizations out there that support families and they provide services or provide you know, lovely gifts um, while your child's in the hospital. And I said, again, I don't want to compete with already a service that's being provided. Mm. So I sat back and I said, well, where's the void? Um, what's missing? And we did, we, we went through family grief counseling for about the first year after Sophia had passed away. But like traditional grief counseling, they kind of say, oh, once you've gone through one year, it was almost like you graduate. And my husband and I would sit there and we we're like, oh, we're not over it. So I don't hard. feel like I've graduated. <laughs> yeah, I don't feel like I'm done. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but it was very cyclical. The, the, counseling sessions because now you kind of bring in the next class and we looked at our boys too and we're like they were you know they were still struggling especially Sophia's twin brother mm. he 
he he went through some really really rough um, patches. I bet to put it lightly. Mm. Um, so we're like we we need we need to talk to people that understand what we've been through. And then the light bulb went off. It's like, well, let's do what Sophia would do. Let's let's create it. <laughs> uh, and then we then it kind of started the fun discussions of well, Sophia would always in the hospital. She'd have these horrible days, getting you know shots, throwing up, getting her NG tube reinserted through her nose, and um, being in pain. And but somehow at the end of every day, she'd be sitting there watching a movie with either Greg or I, and she'd say she just turned to us and say, "This was the best day ever." And I was like, "Gosh, you're amazing!" amazing. Yeah, I was gonna say um, amazing. yeah, and. She found a way to focus on the joyful moments instead of the pain of that day. And I'm like, this is what all of the parents and our families need. Mm -hmm. So we said, let's, let's figure out a way to just get other families like us together. And two of the first families we met, their children did not die from pediatric cancer. They died from um, one, a very freak accident, and another one was a drowning accident. And the six of us would get together and we learned that just like our children's deaths being unique, our children were unique, but we, the common ground was we were all parents, we were all families suffering, and we could have conversations that no one else could understand. And it just, it grew. Um, and so, uh, so that's what we do. We connect we connect families who lost a child. Most of the families are pediatric cancer, but we have a lot of families um, from accidents, um, suicide, drowning, other diseases. Um, so it's it's sadly grown, but we currently serve about 59 families in the greater Cincinnati area. Mm. And um, I'm just honored that they they trust our method and what we're we're trying to do for them. And is it something that you're able to get those people together physically? I know probably in the middle of COVID, it was a little bit more difficult than you wanted it to be, but how, how does it work? How does the support work and how do you connect the families? Uh, yeah, it was very difficult on COVID. Uh, I probably shouldn't have launched during COVID. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we started with just small informal get-togethers. Uh, lots of times we would just host a dinner at our house. Mm. And then it, it started saying, well, let's let's do something that, could be unique and um, a, just a fun setting. So some of our, I think, things that had been well received is we do um, we do a camping retreat where for families to, to get together, and that's great because kids of all different ages can they've they're kind of starting to bond. The siblings are, and we have some older, older siblings now, so they tend to go off to the their own little tables and talk, <laughs> and then the dads kind of go over to a fire pit and talk. And their conversations are different than the moms. Mm -hmm. um, we're starting to do some dad's day out. We we did a dad's adrenaline night where they got to smash stuff and throw axes. Mm. Um, and then we did a mom's spa day because lots of times moms tend to take care of everybody else except for themselves. So it was a way to get the, the moms to do that. Um, the next time the moms get the axes and the dads get the spa. Is that how right. it works? Yeah, okay. Actually, the moms want to do go to a shooting range. That's, yeah. that's one of the feedback. I, <laughs> the feedback I um, but then we're also, we're trying to be a, a, a good resource for these families because a lot of them have said, well, how do you start a nonprofit? Um, and a lot of them want to write a book. So we're mm. doing workshops around topics like that mm. and getting a great response Um just sharing, you know, again, nobody's in competition with each other. We're all just saying, hey, we understand what we're going through. So here's what worked for me. Try it. This helps contact this person. And it's it's just like an extended family, which has been really, really good. And then one thing that we try to do each year, we always do it the night before Easter um, for a couple of different reasons. Sophia was her cancer journey was exactly one year, which was really odd. But she was diagnosed on uh, April 6th, 2016, died on April 5th, 2017. And 
both of those events happened during Holy Week. And it was always, so Easter has always been, at first it was a really hard holiday, but I reflected and actually did a little bit more of um, reading and paying, paying attention to just the darkness and bringing the light back of Holy Week. We wanted to do a different type of remembrance ceremony. And we had gone to a few that were through hospitals or through churches. And I remember my husband always just kind of being almost more angry at those because he was like, I just feel like we're alone. It's just you and I with a candle and this just doesn't feel right. Mm. So we turned it into all the families coming together um, and celebrating the families. And instead of talking about the kids and just the sad memories, we're, we're honoring what they, what we want to remember them for. Mm. And then we usually try to have one or two spotlight families of what are, what have they done in memory of their, their son or daughter, because I'm in awe of what some of these mom and dads have done. And they're just incredible stories of how our children continue to inspire us. And so we, we, we toast to mermaids there. And then we, as uh, my sons like to say, we release paper lanterns so our kids can catch them from mm -hmm. heaven. And it's just a beautiful um, community event where extended families, friends, and all the supporters can come together. And it, it's just, we're trying to just, again, try to um, just bring the joy part of it, not just the sadness. Mm. So that's that's probably one of our, I think, um, most most beautiful where it's not just the bereaved families together. So it's really that's pretty. Great. I love the sort of multi-level nature of it that, you know, so sort of dad's probably grieve and deal with these things in different ways. And moms probably think about them in different ways and siblings think about them in different ways. And you have the ability to bring all those groups together so they can benefit from the support in, in their own way. And, you know, um, just lovely memorial to those that have, have passed and celebrating their life and celebrating the impact they still have and the inspiration they still give us. And I wonder if you're able to extend that. I mean, it sounds like a very warm, personal uh, kind of approach. And I think it sounds like we could use best day ever approach everywhere in the world in lots of different places. Are there other, other chapters, other people doing similar things in other places outside of your hometown, hometown area? Uh, well, I'm sure there are, but not, <laughs> at least not, I think <laughs> They're not affiliates uh, formally yeah. anyway. <laughs> not yet. Maybe, yeah. maybe someday. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you ever want to come to London, we can uh, <laughs> set, set something up here. It'd be great to have. I mean, you mentioned your um, fundraising um, in the past. I mean, despite maybe not loving the loving doing it, you're rather prolific at it, uh, having raised over half a million dollars for various causes since 2016. Um, tell me a little bit about that, you know, kind of the types of organizations that you support and the kinds of great works they're doing for, for patients and families. I'd love to, love to know more about where all that hard work has, who all that hard work is benefiting. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I actually went back to um, shocking my spreadsheet, <laughs> double check my numbers. As an accountant, yes, it makes yeah. sense. Yeah, uh, I'm geeky like that. Uh, I, we've actually raised close, just under seven hundred thousand dollars. Wow, that's um, incredible! And that's net. So, um, yeah, a little small town girl. She she had quite the impact, mm. and that's also with no corporate backing. That's just families, friends, and strangers. Uh, so probably my, my, my biggest campaign was, we called it our Toasting the Mermaids campaign. Mm. When I ran for Woman of the Year for LLS. Um, but mo most of the money that we raised went for LLS, Emily Whitehead Foundation, and Cancer Free Kids, because we were very passionate about giving to more cancer research reflecting on these old chemotherapy treatments are not good enough. Um, we, we have sat in enough meetings with um, just talking about advancements and, and treatments. And I love that my husband would always ask the question, he'd be like, you shouldn't be happy. 
yet because you're not at 100%. So until every child is cured, don't tell me you're happy with something. But he also did a great job of keeping in perspective of why we always found it important to give back and to keep giving, um, working towards more advancements. When we were going through the trial, we knew that they were families who had done fundraising just like us, you know, probably now looking at the calendar, probably 10, 12 years ago. And their efforts helped fund the CAR T-cell therapy and the trials. If they hadn't done that, again, Sophia would have would have died in October. Mm. And we, would have, we would have never gotten that special time with her. We would have never had the opportunity to honor her Make-A-Wish trip and to to learn all about toasting the mermaids. <laughs> it, it would have never existed. And mm. knowing that family's selfless act back then, we hope that, you know, by us doing all the fundraising that we've done in the last six years or so, that the next family benefiting from this round of fundraising, that they'll get more time. Because at the end of the day, that is all anybody really wants is just more time with their loved ones. I mean, it's truly paying it forward, right? They did it 10 or 12 years ago and yeah. you're hopefully doing it now with for patients that'll come, come in the future. So I think it's so inspirational yeah. and, you know, just, I think I told you this when I read the, the book, you know, praying for Emily and just so such an inspiring story, the Whitehead family and Emily and how, how the great work they're doing. Um, you guys are, I'm in awe of people like yourself that can take something that obviously was, you know, negative for the family, but turn it into something so, so positive, um, for yourselves and for others and just inspirational, um, to hear about what you're doing and with the best day ever foundation and the families you support and, you know, your support, support of the Emily Whitehead foundation and others. Thanks. It's, um, many times, uh, we always shared like when we go to the Emily Whitehead uh, foundation, the believe ball, you know, we're usually in the minority because it's it's so much fun to celebrate all the kids that are the success stories. But um, you know, we we need to keep reminding people that it's it's Sophia's stories and the ones who don't make it that is why we don't stop working um, till they're all success stories. And it it, it would be almost easy to just kind of hide away from the world and and just feel like you know what. We uh, we lost our girl, and we're, we're not going to do this anymore. Mm. But knowing knowing the lives that we've touched and the the personal testimonies that we get for what we're doing um, keeps me going. And and knowing that I always I always hear Sophia's voice of never give up. You just you keep you keep going and keep doing what she would do. So. Yeah. Um, no, it's a great message, never to give up. And and you said, I heard you say this kind of idea that, you know, relying on a treatment that's 40 years old and it's just not good enough. Um, you know, I wonder what other messages you might like to send as a as an advocate for families who've lost, you know, loved ones to cancer or child to cancer. You know, what is the medical community, policymakers, insurance companies, you know, what, what are the kinds of messages that they need to hear? I think a lot of this a lot of what you said should ring true. You know, all of us want the same thing, which is more patients treated, more patient successful outcomes, you know, against cancer. But we know that very, very few patients, unfortunately, are able to have that outcome. So what, what's the call to action that, that you have in your mind that, that we should share with oh. the community today, do you think? Um, I wish I could. I actually, I think I, I think I did share it with the uh, FDA hearing of mm. don't overthink it. Just just do what you know is right. Mm. Uh, you can, if you can overanalyze something and, and then it almost, it takes the good away from it, but there is no one perfect, one size fits all solution. So stop putting up so much red tape and, and hurdles. Let, let the, the doctors and the families make decisions within reasonable parameters. Mm. Um, and then that way, I, I think that empowers individuals to be their own best advocates. You stay more connected with the medical team and ultimately what we all need to do is work together. Mm. <laughs> it's like it, it stop working against each other and just 
we can we can figure this out. The answers are there. Hmm. Just don't overcomplicate it. <laughs> Life is simple. I, that's right. <laughs> Keep it simple, stupid, as they say. Yep. Um, I find myself kind of vacillating between wanting to celebrate the victories as we get them, you know, new approvals, new products in the clinical pipeline, you know, these kinds of things are to be celebrated. You know, the, the patients that we do do are able to treat, you know, some almost 7,000 last year by, the, by our count, you know, that's 7,000 patients that potentially might not have make, made it had they not been able to be treated by those, you know, six approved CAR, th CAR T therapies. And, and then I flipped to the other side to say, well, what about the other 98%? You know, what about the other folks that probably didn't have a great outcome um, because they weren't able to get, get, uh, get to access the treatment they need. And so I think it, you know, for me, the keep it simple, don't overcomplicate it and, you know, celebrate the small wins, but we got to keep going. You know, yep. ultimately we can't be satisfied um, because there's so much more work to do. Uh, and, you know, I do to find myself saying, in, in per, the purveyor of inconvenient truths on on panels and things to say, you know, we have had successes, but they aren't good enough. The status quo is not good enough for patients. It's not good enough for the industry. Um, and we have to keep going. So right. I think uh, keeping it simple is a great way to, to uh, streamline that message, probably. Yeah, I had an old boss who always used the uh, analogy, there's there's no checkered flag. So you can still celebrate that lap, but you better keep going. You're That's not right. done. Keep going around the circle. Yep. That's great. I don't know if everyone in the world will get the NASCAR reference, but I, I <laughs> certainly not. do. As a as a Richmond boy born and bred, there's a NASCAR race there every year. So, um, Well, thank you so much for spending some time with us today. It's been absolutely inspirational for me and, um, you know, just – and all of, of your ability to turn this into an, a, a great positive thing and, and to live Sophia's memory in such a positive way. I wonder if I could ask one last question um, about kind of your hopes and dreams for the next five to 10 years. You know, what do you think the, what would you like to say that, you know, if you project yourself and I don't even want to say the, say the year, cause it just sounds like the Jetsons will be flying around like 2033 and 10 years from now. Um, you know, when you look back, what will the, have the foundation have accomplished? Where will we be as an industry? Where might, you know, advanced therapies be? Um, what are your, what's your hope for the next 10 years? I, I think just more openness, more talking about it, um, taking away the old, the old stigmas of, um, trying to, to hide the, the, I guess the, the ugly side of it. Mm. So let's just be real. Let's be honest let's get things av available. Uh, that's a, a, a big one, but I don't know. I, I keep coming back to taking away the, the stigma of being able to talk about things, mm. so whether it's the, the, the really ugly pieces of the treatment, or when you come over, like in our situation on the, the death side, the grieving process of why does everything have to, be quiet and right. we don't really want to, we don't want to hear about that. So why can't it just be a safe place for people to talk freely and, um, and support one, one another. Yeah. So that's, that's really where I, I hope to keep going. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm a little rusty on some of the scientific advances of, um, reading white papers at one point, I think I was reading them all night long and <laughs> odd hours and not sleeping, but, the, um, you know, I, I feel like on the, the grief side where I'm more recently connected, we are seeing a transformation of mm. it's okay to bring people together and it's okay to not necessarily grieve one way. Mm. Um, there are, there are safe guidelines to follow, but there's other avenues out there. Sure. And it's, it's great to see people coming together, I guess, and working on that. Yeah. More openness, more successes, more yeah. support. All those things I think would be a good outcome um, for sure. For people like myself and, and no doubt others that are inspired by your story, how can they get involved with what you're doing at the at the Best Day Ever Foundation, um, either through volunteering or make a donation? What, what other ways could they get involved? We always, um, we love it when, whether it's a business or a, a family or organization wants to volunteer or donate an experience for our families. Mm. So we, we, we love partnering up. Um, like I think I mentioned the, 
the uh, mom spa day, the spa that we team up with, they donate most of the services, which is mm -hmm. incredible. Um, so that's, that's fantastic. If anyone can, you know, help with that. Mm -hmm. uh, we always love sponsoring an event like our shine a night. We, we can always use little uh, help with the costs of that. And, um, and then again, just small donations of helping to, um, almost like adopting a family for, mm. for an experience. So we, we do have some, some, um, donors will, will adopt a family for the camping event, which is, which is always kind of sweet so that we enjoy. It oh, sounds lovely. Yeah. And they can find you on a website, I'm guessing, or how would they find you? Um, best day ever foundation us is our website. And I, I always like to share too, you know, we're probably not who you and who families initially reach out to because right after the passing of a child, it's, uh, I think you're in such a, I hate to use a fault word fog, but you're mm -hmm. in a space that you really almost don't know what's going on. And initially you, you are surrounded, um, by a lot of loved ones, family, friends, support. Mm. But reality is no no supporters can can stay by your side 24-7. Right. And eventually, eventually it gets quiet. Mm. And it, it does get dark. Mm. Um, we like to say that that's, that's when we're probably at the right path to, you know, take the journey with us because we definitely realize that this is not a journey to take alone and um we'll try to try to help find those joyful moments again but we're here when they're ready for us awesome what a wonderful note to to end on and they can find you at best day ever foundation.us as you said and to look to get involved or make a donation and support amy and her her family and and the great work they're doing for for families so Thank you so much uh, for spending some time with us today. 